Story number one, Blast from the Past. I was never much for family. I was the only child of a mom who worked too much and a dad who bailed on us the moment he got the chance. I know that she only worked so hard because she needed to make enough money to take care of me, but I couldn't help feeling that she was really avoiding me because she blamed me for my dad leaving. It was the summer of 2007. I had just finished my first year at university and decided it was time to head home for a break. At first, I was going to spend the summer break with some new friends I had made. However, my mom called me earlier in the year to tell me that my grandmother passed away. Like I said, I'm not that big into the whole family thing, so her passing didn't bother me much. I hardly knew her, and I think the only time I had actually spent any time with her was one Christmas when I was 12. She gave me a doll. I was not impressed. That was all I could think about when my mom told me that she was dead. You can think of me as heartless, but how can you be sad about someone you hardly ever knew passing away? Anyway, I decided to head back home for the summer because my mom needed help clearing out the house my grandmother had left her. Usually I wouldn't have bothered, but it was a pretty decent house and I had my own agenda at the time. You see, my mom would never leave the home she'd raised me in, so it was a good guess she might give my grandmother's house to me when I finished university. I drove to the house on a Friday morning with the intent that it might be mine one day. So, all of my energy went into Operation Cleanup. For the next week, I spent every spare moment I had clearing old, broken furniture and helping my mom sell what we could. It was a tougher job than I was expecting, but we got through it. I remember how hot it was the day we tackled the attic. It was packed full of boxes, cobwebs, and rats. I'd be lying if I didn't say I let out the occasional squeal while shuffling through the boxes. At some point, my mom went off to pick up a pizza and some drinks. I stayed behind and kept working. I didn't want to spend another day on the attic. I started taking the boxes down the stairs to go through them. What I found was mostly useless. Old photos and black and white paintings, but the one box contained what looked like leather-bound journals. It was going to take another hour for my mom to get back with the pizza, so I grabbed one and took a seat. The more I read, the more I came to realize that these journals belonged to my great-grandmother. Each journal seemed to contain the happenings for an entire year. The oldest one seemed to date back to 1879. I'll admit, it was pretty cool reading the thoughts of a woman that lived over a century ago. She talked so differently. It was hard for me to understand some of the terms she used. The pages were so thick and yellowed. The words were written in a deep black ink. It was like I had stepped into a time machine. I got to the journal that was from 1888, and it turned out that my great-grandmother found herself wandering the streets late at night. She spoke of how the street lamps were so dim and the fog was so thick that she wouldn't be able to see where she was going. My great-grandmother worked as a night nurse in London in her youth. She was quickly becoming one of my heroes. It was in this journal that I read something truly disturbing. On the night of June 3rd in 1888, my grandmother wrote of a man who she passed on the street. He was tall and wore a leather apron. She wrote about how odd it was to see someone else prowling the streets at such a late hour. She wrote details about how he smelt strongly of cigarette smoke and whiskey. She said how she was still polite and nodded her greeting as she passed him. Then she wrote about how he continued to follow her down the street. The man kept his distance but she could hear his footsteps echoing in hers. She hurried on her way, but the man seemed to hurry after her. My heart was pounding in my chest as I read. The next page continued on the next day, and my grandmother only briefly mentioned how the night before scared her and that she would be more vigilant on her way home in the future. Something didn't sit right with me. I was happy that my grandmother was okay, but there was something about her encounter that put a knot in my stomach. There was one detail that she wrote about that stood out in my mind. She said that the man was wearing a leather apron. I took my phone out and did a little research. All I had to type in was the date, 1888, and the words leather apron, and my jaw practically dropped to the ground when I saw the results. Leather apron was one of the nicknames given to a famous serial killer that prowled the streets of London in 1888. He was better known as Jack the Ripper. Now, you don't have to believe me, and I have no proof other than this old, handwritten journal. I'm not entirely sure of it myself, but I think my great-grandmother actually met Jack the Ripper and survived. Story number two, The Drifter. I spent the better part of my youth traveling back and forth between Hartford and New Haven in Connecticut in the early 2000s. 
I was a truck driver and I basically took any job that was thrown my way. I guess I wanted to get out on the road. I liked the freedom of it. Still, when 2006 came along and I realized I was basically living inside my truck, I decided to make some life changes. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to tell you about the strange encounter I had with a drifter in 2002. I had just left New Britain with a large load. I don't really remember what the load was, but I remember being excited about it paying a lot. It was a week's turnaround and I would be picking another load up on the way back, so it was shaping out to be a good start to the month. It was just outside of New Britain when I came across a drifter. He was walking alongside the road with his hand hanging out over the side and his thumb pointing up. I don't usually stop for drifters. I've heard way too many horror stories about drifters being crazy, drugged up murderers. There were no stops along that road, at least not for another 10 miles. I keep a crowbar hidden next to my seat for protection. So, I guess there wasn't a lot of stopping me from pulling my truck over to the side and opening up the passenger door. It was a long walk to the next stop and I knew for a fact that no one else was going to be picking this guy up. You could say I felt sorry for him. I waited as the man hurried around to the passenger side and climbed up. He struggled, as most people did when they climbed into my truck for the first time. It probably didn't help that he was a little bit on the heavy side. Once he was in and the door was closed, we were off. The first few minutes were awkward. I didn't really know what to say. Thankfully, he spoke first and asked me what my name was. I told him and he told me I could call him Devin. He went on to thank me and I asked him where it was I was taking him. He didn't really have a destination. He said he was just going as far as I could take him. I found it odd, but I know what it's like to want to get away. We spent most of the trip in silence, and I was honestly rethinking the whole thing. I could barely handle a few hours of awkwardness, let alone a whole week. I started thinking up reasons to drop him off early. I did not want this guy in my truck for a whole week. I glanced over him and noticed that he was sweating, like a lot. I know he's a big guy, but I didn't have my heater on and it wasn't that hot outside. He was breathing as if he'd just run a whole marathon and he was squeezing his hands so tight that his knuckles were turning white. At this point I was getting nervous. My first thought was drugs, but there was something else going on. I could see it in his eyes. He was panicking about something. It was freaking me out. I stepped on the gas and floored it to the nearest stop. I might have been freaking out, but I wasn't about to just pull over in the middle of nowhere and kick the guy out. We made it to the next pit stop and I made up some excuse about why the guy had to jump out. He didn't seem happy but he climbed out of my truck eventually. He looked around a lot and he seemed angry as if the amount of people around us bothered him. I drove away and never looked back. Now, it wasn't until a few years later that I heard the name Devin again. The name William Devin Howell was all over the news not too long ago but I didn't put two and two together until I saw a picture of him. The man that goes by the name William Devin Howell was arrested in the Connecticut area for committing several murders. He was arrested a while ago, but in 2007, a tip from his cellmate led police to the back of a Connecticut strip mall where they found three more bodies to add to his list. It was him. The man I had sitting next to me for a whole 10 mile drive. The drifter that I took pity on and led into my truck. He was a serial killer. I keep thinking back to that day. Was he planning on doing something to me? Is that why he was acting so strange? It makes me sick just thinking about it. Story number three, a family vacation. My family have a lake cabin just outside of Phoenix, Arizona. I can remember spending a lot of the holidays out there. The snow falls around Christmas time and the lake freezes up. Obviously, Christmas is when we spend the most time out there. Even after me and my sisters grew up and moved out, we all still make an effort to drive down there and spend the Christmas holidays together. In the year 2016, I was driving down to the lake cabin in early December. I'd gotten off work early that year and was packed and ready. The rest of my family wasn't going to be arriving until at least a week later, but that didn't really bother me. I liked being by myself and the cabin was one of my favorite places to be. So, I let them all know that I would be heading down there early. It was a long drive, since I live at least 10 hours away. I left late at night. The plan was to drive through the night, when the roads are quiet, and arrive in the early morning. I did exactly that, but the roads weren't exactly quiet for the whole drive. It was around 4 in the morning, and I was 4 energy drinks in 6 hours into the drive when I saw a flash of red and blue behind me. A moment later, I heard the sirens echoing in the distance. 
I quickly pulled to the side of the road and slowed down as the police car sped past me. It was strange, seeing a police car all the way out there, but I didn't put too much thought into it at the time. About an hour went by and I spotted the flashing lights behind me again. I pulled to the side just as another four police cars sped past me. You can imagine I was getting worried. Seeing one police car all the way out here was a fluke, but seeing multiple police cars meant that they were looking for something. There's a lot of wilderness in and around Arizona, and it's not uncommon for escaped convicts and suspected criminals to run into the forest and hide from the police. At the time, there were two serial killers plaguing Phoenix, and my first thought was that it was one of them. I kept on driving. If the police were searching for someone, I didn't want to risk stopping my car in the area. I carried on to the cabin, and six more police cars sped past me before I got there, only confirming my suspicions that they were looking for someone. I made it to the cabin, parked my car, and headed inside. I was a bit tired, so I left my bags in the car and decided to check the place out first. Usually the cabin needed a bit of airing out and a good dusting before the holidays could begin. However, when I got inside the cabin, the air wasn't as stale as I was expecting it to be. There was an icy cold draft blowing in from the back of the cabin. Someone could have left a window open last time we were there. That's what I was thinking as I was locking the door behind me, but then I heard something moving in one of the back rooms. I froze as the blood in my veins turned to ice. We've had rats in the past, but whatever I heard moving was much too large to be a rat. There wouldn't be any raccoons with how cold it is outside. I moved slowly as I turned to face the direction of the sound. The door to the back room was open and swung slightly, its hinges squeaking in the cold. I took a step forward, the floorboards beneath my feet moaning at the sudden, added weight. Something heard the moan and rushed towards the door. I heard heavy, thundering footsteps running through the back room and towards me. I spun round on my heels and unlocked the front door. The footsteps sounded like they were right behind me as I rushed outside and hopped back into my car. Just as I was reversing out of the driveway, I spotted a hand grip the doorknob and pulled the front door, which I had left open, shut. I raced to the nearest stop and called my parents to let them know what happened. They advised me to call the police, so I did. I met the police at the cabin and they searched the whole area. A window in the back room had been smashed open and it looked as if someone had been sleeping there. The police went on to inform me that there had been a recent sighting of a man they believed to be the Phoenix serial killer in the area and they'd been searching for him all night. My heart practically stopped beating in my chest. I'm not sure if the man who ran at me inside my cabin was indeed the Phoenix serial killer, but it would be one hell of a coincidence if it wasn't him. I felt like I escaped death that day, and the cabin hasn't felt the same way to me since. Story number one, Candy Apple. I've lived in the same neighborhood my whole life. It's one of those small, quaint places where everyone knows everyone, and you'll get into trouble if your lawn doesn't look as clean as the guys next to you. Anyway, I like it, and that's why I decided to stay. Even when I got older and had kids of my own, I still live in the same neighborhood only a few blocks down from the house I grew up in and where my parents still live. The coolest part about this neighborhood is the amount of effort everyone puts into decorating for Halloween. We even have competitions to see whose house looks the best. I haven't won yet, but I keep trying. When Halloween night comes around, it's kind of a given that the streets are filled with kids in costumes running from house to house, looking for candy. The local police department even blocks off the roads on either side to stop any cars driving down. I used to love going trick-or-treating when I was a kid, but stopped when I was around 16 years old out of fear of being teased by my friends. You never actually want to stop trick-or-treating, but eventually we all reach an age where you just have to. So, you can imagine my joy when my daughter was finally old enough to go out for her first night of trick-or-treating. On the night, we both got dressed up and headed out early. I'll admit, it was more for me than for her, but she was really looking forward to getting some free candy, and she wasn't complaining about getting to dress up and act like a princess for the whole night. We hit a few houses that I used to hit when I was younger. It was awkward at first, since I knew most of the people who answered the door, and they gave me strange looks due to the fact that I was dressed up like the Bride of Frankenstein. Still, I was really enjoying myself, and it seemed like my daughter was quickly becoming the avid Halloween lover like myself. We were about halfway through the night when my daughter started getting tired. I decided we could stop at one last house before heading back home. This house was on the edge of the street, and I can't say I'd been to it before. 
The garden wasn't as well kept as everyone else's, and there were very few decorations, aside from the random carved pumpkins and fake cobwebs. It seemed a little dodgy, but my daughter was on the sugar craze and practically dragged me to the door. We did the usual knock and yelled out trick or treat. We stood there, bags at the ready, and smiles on our faces. It was a while before someone came to the door. When the door swung open, it was slow and the hinges creaked as if it was the first time the door had been opened in years. The old and worn out face of a woman appeared in a small gap in the door. She glared at us with her beady eyes. I was half expecting the door to slam in our faces a few seconds later. Instead, the woman's arm, which was skinnier than a twig, stretched out through the gap holding a single candy apple. My daughter's face lit up and she snatched it from the woman. I reminded her to say thank you and she did. The woman didn't react though. She simply slunk back into the darkness of her home and pushed the door closed. It was the weirdest encounter of the night. I held the candy apple as we walked home to stop my daughter from eating it on the way. As soon as we got home, I put her candy away and told her to get ready for bed. She'd already eaten some of it, so I figured that was enough for the night. I put her candy apple in the fridge and forgot about it for most of the evening. It was still early in the evening and I was in the Halloween spirit. While my daughter slept, I decided to watch a few horrors and enjoy the rest of the night. After the second movie, my daughter's candy started looking pretty good. Before you say anything about stealing my daughter's hard-earned candy, I was going to replace anything I ate. So, I went through her stash that I had hidden away, and that was when I remembered the candy apple. You see, I knew my daughter would simply lick the candy off and then throw the apple away. It would be a waste. I decided to eat it and simply buy her another one on the way to school or something. I sat down on the couch, licking away the candy while the third horror movie of the night played. I got through the candy and reached the apple. As I bit into it, I felt a sharp, sudden pain in the roof of my mouth, and instead of tasting the juiciness of the apple, I tasted blood. I dropped the apple and raced to the bathroom. There was blood dripping from my mouth, and I couldn't see where it was coming from. At first, I thought I broke a tooth when I bit into the apple, but the pain wasn't around my teeth, and they seemed fine. Once I got the bleeding under control, I went back to the apple and had a look at it. Once I washed my blood off, I could see the area where I bit into it, and there was the tip of a rusty nail sticking out from inside the apple. I almost vomited at the sight of it. You can probably guess what happened next. I woke my daughter up and dropped her off with a neighbor while her husband rushed me to the nearest hospital. They did blood tests for rust poisoning and got me patched up. I then contacted the police and sent them to the old woman's house. Part of me wants to feel guilty for stealing my daughter's candy in the first place, but then the other part of me is just glad she wasn't the one that bit into that apple. I can't believe there are monsters out there that would do something like that to an innocent child. Story number two, an awful trick. I was one of those trick-or-treaters that actually followed through with the trick part of the deal. Basically, if someone didn't give me a treat, they got a trick. It wasn't just me, my friends joined in and the tricks were their ideas most of the time. Back in 2005, I think I was around 14 at the time, my friends and I went out trick-or-treating for Halloween night. I can't remember what we were dressed up as, but I do remember we never really put a lot of effort into it. Anyway, most of the night was uneventful. We walked down a few streets and hit all of the houses with the best decorations because they were bound to have all the best candy. When we ran out of those houses, we started going to the mediocre ones. Most of them had candy, even if it wasn't good candy, but we came up to this one house that didn't give us any candy at all. We knocked on the door and when the guy inside answered, he yelled at us to grow up and leave him alone. Naturally, we weren't just going to walk away. We gathered at the other side of the street and started planning our revenge. There were a lot of ideas being thrown around, and we eventually settled on the idea of breaking into the guy's house later that night while he was asleep. We moved on, finished up our trick-or-treating for the night, and made plans to meet back there after midnight. Let's just say, we didn't think that anything could really go wrong. We'd break into the guy's house, make some noise, scare the hell out of him, and then get out of there before he called the cops. As you can probably guess, that's not what happened. We all got there just past midnight and checked the place out. All the lights were off, so we figured the guy had gone to sleep. We made our way around the house until one of the guys spotted an open window around the back. It was small and low to the ground. 
It led to the basement and was just big enough for thin, prepubescent boys to fit through, which is probably why it wasn't closed or locked. I was the brave one, so my friends helped me climb through and lowered me down. They then handed me a flashlight and said they'd meet me by the front door where I would let them in. I never made it that far. I flicked the flashlight on and walked around the basement. I scanned each corner slowly. It seemed like your average basement. There were all sorts of boxes dumped down there, and a big metal furnace groaned loudly in the corner. Its soft orange glow didn't reach the back of the basement where I was, but it lit up what looked like the stairs to the exit. I headed that way, continuing to scan the room with my flashlight. That was when I caught something out of the corner of my eye. There was a metal gleam near the furnace. It was as if something shiny was reflecting the light. I turned towards it and squinted through the dark as I turned my flashlight in the same direction. Before the light hit it, I could see a shape moving in the corner beside the stairs. It wasn't noticeable at first, but there was a dark mass that seemed to sway and bob up and down slightly. As my flashlight shined on the dark mass, my heart stopped beating for a split second before a rush of adrenaline sent me running up the stairs in front of me and through the house. The man who had answered the door earlier in that night was sitting down in the basement. His eyes were wide open and unblinking staring at me the whole time with a sickening scowl stretched across his lips. He was so still aside from the occasional breath, and in his hands he clutched onto the biggest, sharpest machete I have ever seen. It caught the light and blinded me for a moment. I didn't even have time to think. I was out of there so fast. I didn't want to know why he was just sitting down in the basement and what he'd planned on doing with that machete. I tripped and flew over all sorts of furniture as I ran through his house. I found a window, opened it, and threw myself through it. My friends were shocked, but when they saw me running for my life, they were quick to follow. I told them all about it later, and they thought I was just trying to scare them. It goes without saying that we didn't tell anyone else about it, but we never went back there, not even on Halloween. Story number three, too old for trick-or-treating. A few years ago, I was around 15 years old, and I had already made the decision to stay home for Halloween. My mother was half disappointed and half relieved. She liked seeing how excited I got about going trick-or-treating, but she also saw it as an opportunity to go out with her friends while I stay at home and hand out the candy. A lot of my friends were still going out that year, but I just thought I was too old for it. Instead, I ordered a pizza and spent the night playing horror games on my Xbox. I still love Halloween, so I wanted to do something to celebrate it. Even though my mother gave me instructions to hand out candy to anyone who came knocking, I wasn't really in the mood for that. I put the candy in a large bowl outside the front door with a sign that read, Take one, and that was that. I locked up and prepared myself for a long night of uninterrupted gaming. I had finished my pizza about an hour into the gaming and was working my way through a few chocolates I stole from the bowl of candy my mother left out. The night flew by. I had heard a few footsteps running up the front porch, but no one knocked on the door. Then, as I was getting up to get myself a drink, I heard a soft knocking. I rolled my eyes and sighed. I figured the bowl of candy was empty and that I'd have to give up some of mine. I grabbed a handful of chocolates and headed to the front door. I opened it up, expecting to be greeted by the usual trick-or-treat screams, but there was no one there. The street was practically empty. I shrugged it off and closed the door. I got my drink and sat back down. However, before I could unpause my game, I heard another knock at the door. I was thoroughly annoyed at this point and practically stomped to the door. Again, as I flung the door open, there was no one there. This time, I stomped out, flung my fists into the air, and shouted at whoever it was to buzz off. I slammed the door closed and decided not to bother opening it again. I returned to my gaming. Not a moment later, I heard a knock again but it wasn't coming from the front door this time. It was coming from the back of the house. I was still somewhat annoyed, but also a little worried at this point. I was convinced that some kids were playing a prank on me, but now they were running around to the back of my house and knocking on my back door. I wasn't even sure if the back door was locked. I got up, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and headed towards the back door. I checked that it was locked, and thankfully, it was. There was a window right beside it, and I pulled the curtain aside slightly and glanced out. It was really dark, but I could clearly see that there was no one there. I considered calling my mother, but as I turned around I saw something that made my heart stop. Now, my house has a pretty normal design. 
there's a long hallway that moves through the whole house, from the front door to the back door. So while standing at the back door, I had a straight line of sight to the front door. As I turned around, I looked down the hallway and saw that the front door was wide open. A million thoughts ran through my head at that moment, and I clutched the kitchen knife tightly. I wasn't sure if I had forgotten to lock it the last time I closed the front door. I knew my mother wouldn't have just come home without announcing herself and leaving the door open. I felt my jean pocket, but I didn't have my phone on me. I had left it by the couch where I'd been sitting all night. I didn't know who had opened the door or where they were, so there was only one thing I could do. I bolted straight down that hallway as fast as my legs could carry me and holding the knife out in front of me. I ran straight out the front door and across the street to my neighbor's house. They'd been having kids knock on their door all night, so they were shocked when they opened the door to me banging on it. I practically rushed inside, scaring the living daylights out of them. They managed to calm me down while they called the cops. When they got there and searched my house, they found that it was empty, but there was someone there because they'd taken my Xbox and the television with them. My mother gave me hell for the incident for a whole month after that, but she was happy that I was okay. All I can say about that night is I'm glad I didn't go trick-or-treating, because then my mother would have been left home alone, and who knows what could have happened to her. Story number one. A real monster. When I was younger, Halloween used to terrify me. I was scared of my own shadow. I had a nightmare every night and I used to wake up screaming that there was a monster in my closet or hiding underneath my bed. I know, I sound pathetic. One night, my dad decided that he was tired of me being scared of everything. It just happened to be the night of Halloween and he was determined to take me out trick-or-treating. I was around 10 years old at the time and I hadn't gone out on Halloween night at all. There was no way I was going to run around with people in frightening masks and scary costumes, but my dad insisted. At the time, I hated him for it, but now I see why he was doing it. Anyway, as far as I can remember, the night wasn't that bad. He took me to a few houses and I got a lot of candy. I was terrified at first, but my father helped me see that none of it was real. He told me that real monsters don't exist. It was only later that night that we realized he was wrong. I had gotten my fill of candy and eventually my dad walked us back home. This was years ago, so not all of the details are fresh in my mind. If I remember correctly, my dad seemed a little worried while we were walking home. He kept looking over his shoulder at something. Whenever I looked to see what it was, all I saw was a street filled with parents and their children. Once we got home, my dad rushed me inside and eyed the street for a while longer before coming in himself. I had no idea what was happening at the time. I was far more interested in my candy. A few hours later, my mom took my candy away and told me to get ready for bed. I remember not being scared that night. I used to stay up all night scanning the shadows for monsters. I would even grab my flashlight that I kept hidden under my pillow and I would check my closet and underneath my bed at least three times before finally going to sleep. I didn't do any of that. I closed my eyes and went straight to sleep. I'm not sure why, but I woke up in the middle of the night and it was dark. My nightlight had run out of battery power and I'd forgotten to plug it in. At first I wasn't that bothered. I wasn't feeling as scared as usual, so I lied in the dark for a while. Then I started to wonder why I woke up in the first place. I reached underneath my pillow and felt around for my flashlight. My hand wrapped around the flashlight just as I heard something rustling around behind me. I froze. I can't properly describe the amount of fear that I felt in that moment. My hands were shaking and sweat started to drip from my forehead. I slowly pulled my flashlight out from underneath my pillow and turned around. I clicked the flashlight on, and the bright beam lit up my room just as something darted down behind the board at the foot of my bed. I gasped and pulled my knees up to my chest. My initial thought was that there was a monster hiding underneath my bed. I remember my dad telling me that monsters aren't real, and that's probably the only reason I had the courage to climb out of my bed and check underneath my bed. I shined the flashlight underneath my bed, half expecting to see some kind of terrifying monster sneering back at me. Instead, I saw boots at the base of my bed. They weren't my boots. They were big enough to be my father's, but I didn't know why his boots would be in my bedroom. In that moment, they moved. I gasped again and fell back. I crawled backwards, grabbing at the carpet with my hands and clawing my way towards the bedroom door as a tall figure stood up from the bottom of my bed. They towered over me. I had dropped my flashlight, so all I could see was a glint in their eyes as they glared down at me. 
I let out a scream and rushed out of my room. I ran straight across the hallway and into my parents' bedroom. My parents were used to me running into their room and screaming about monsters under my bed, but they didn't expect me to start talking about a man with boots standing by my bed. My dad leaped into action and rushed into my room. He found the window to my bedroom wide open, but no one was there. My mom called the police and my dad rushed out the front door with a bat. He stalked the neighborhood, searching for someone. I never fully understood what happened that night until my parents explained it to me recently. On the walk home, my dad noticed that someone was following us. That's why he had been acting so strange and why he leaped into action. That same man who'd been following us climbed through my window that night. I'm not sure what he was planning on doing with me or how long he was in my room before I woke up. The thought always sends chills down my spine. My dad was wrong. There are real monsters in the world and I saw one of them when I was younger. Story number two, Lost Little Lamb. I love my little sister. Say what you want about that, but it's true. She means the whole world to me. There was a time when I almost lost her, and that was the most terrifying moment of my life. It was Halloween night, and trick-or-treating is something me and my sister love to do together. We usually dress up in matching costumes. The year before this story, we went as Batman and Robin. I was Batman, and of course, we got so many compliments. The year that this story takes place, my little sister wanted to do something different. She said she wanted to be cuter. I can understand that. I thought she looked pretty cute as a little robin, but she was more of a princesses and kittens type of girl. So, I let her pick the costumes and before I knew it we were going trick-or-treating as little Bo Peep and her little lamb. Obviously, I was little Bo Peep and my little sister was the little lamb. I have to say, she looked adorable and I didn't look too bad myself. We got so many compliments. Now, at the time of this story, I was around 17 years old. As much as I loved doing things with my sister, I'll admit that the trick-or-treating was mostly for her. I hadn't gone trick-or-treating since I was a lot younger. There was a Halloween party that night and I really wanted to go. I didn't want to let my little sister down, and my parents would have never let her go out on her own. I made a decision that night and I've regretted it every day since. I decided that I'd take her out for some trick-or-treating earlier in the evening and then stop by the party on the way home. I knew she wouldn't mind because she also just liked being around me. Anyway, we headed to the party a little earlier in the night than I was expecting. My sister was getting tired and I knew she wanted to go home soon. So, we skipped the last few houses and went straight to the party. I had hoped to go later in the night when most of the people had gone home. That wasn't the case. When we arrived, it seemed like the party was only just getting started. The music was loud, the people were loud, everyone was drinking, and it was easy to get lost in the crowd. That's exactly what happened. I keep blaming myself for that night. I was having too much fun. I got distracted. I looked away for one second, and when I looked back, my sister was gone. I went straight into panic mode and practically screamed her name out at the top of my lungs. Everyone gave me worried glances and annoyed glares. I was ruining their party vibe. I didn't care. I searched the crowd for her, but she was so small and there were so many people. My heart was beating out of my chest, and I struggled to breathe every second I couldn't find her. Even though the music was so loud it deafened my own thoughts, I heard a deep voice somewhere in the crowd. I didn't recognize the voice. I didn't know where it was coming from or who it belonged to. The only reason I chose to follow the voice was because of what I heard it say. It said, It's a lost little lamb. How cute. There was something about that voice saying those words that made me sick. It was as if something took over me. I followed that voice through all the chaos and all the noise until I found my little sister. She was trapped, surrounded by a group of tall, rough men. It wasn't hard to tell that these men were drunk. They were barely able to stand up straight and most of the words coming out of their mouths were slurred and unrecognizable as English. I wasn't thinking at the time. My only thought was for my little sister's safety. I saw one of them reach down and grab her arm, and I pushed forward without thinking. I slammed my shoulder into the guy, knocking him out of the way and into his friends. I made a path through their group and grabbed my little sister. She wrapped her arms around me as I lifted her up and carried her away from them. I could hear them laughing, and I'm pretty sure they would have followed after me if they weren't too drunk to walk. I got my sister out of that party and took her home. I was so grateful to have found her safe and sound. I was expecting my mother to bite my head off when I got my little sister home, but thankfully my little sister didn't tell her anything. She kept it between us. She really is the best part of my life, and I don't even want to think about what could have happened to her that night. 
The thought of losing her scares the hell out of me. Story number three, The Big Storm. It was about three years ago when Halloween night brought us the most horrible storm we'd seen in ages. I didn't actually have anything planned for Halloween that year. I was starting to see it as a boring holiday meant to fool parents and children into giving all their money to the candy companies. Anyway, even though I had no plans for Halloween, I was still looking forward to spending some time alone at home. That didn't happen. The storm outside meant that the streets were flooded and my parents weren't able to take my younger brothers trick-or-treating. We were all stuck at home. It wasn't a bad night. We ordered some Chinese food and rented a few movies. My parents promised that after they sent my brothers to bed, I could watch some horrors. Honestly, it was turning into the best Halloween ever. The night turned sour really quickly when my parents got a call from the Chinese restaurant we ordered our food from. Their delivery driver was only riding a tiny scooter, and there was no way he was going to be able to reach us in the storm. My parents got into their car and left to fetch the food. My little brothers couldn't stay still, so they begged my parents to let them go with. Long story short... I ended up alone at home just like I wanted. I wasn't sure how long they'd be gone, so I put on one of my scarier movies and made a bowl of popcorn. The storm only got worse outside. The howling wind threatened to blow the tiles off the roof. The rain slammed against the windows and the doors even rattled. None of it bothered me, but then I heard a knocking at the door. Now, I can't overstate how bad the storm was outside. The streets were properly flooded and the wind looked like it was trying to blow the trees away. My parents had left before it got worse, otherwise they might have suggested sandwiches for dinner instead. Anyway, it was extremely unlikely that anyone would be out on the streets in that weather, and yet someone was knocking at the front door. I hesitated at first. After all, why would someone be knocking at my door, in this storm, so late at night? I eventually got up to check who it might be. When I looked through the peephole, I didn't see anyone standing on the other side. I reached for the doorknob, but just as I was about to pull the bolt aside... Something stopped me. Call it a sixth sense or instinct. I cleared my throat and called out, asking who was there. It was silent for a moment, then a soft, deep voice replied, Trick or treat. You're probably thinking it was some poor child who simply insisted on getting some candy, even though the weather was horrible and his parents didn't care enough to tell him not to. That wasn't the case. It wasn't a child's voice that responded, not even close. This voice was deep and sickening. I pulled away from the door. After a few moments, they knocked again, and I yelled at them to go away. That was when the same deep and sickening voice asked me, Are you alone in there? It wasn't just the question that tied a knot in my stomach and made a knot form in my throat. It was the way he said it. There was a certain glee in his voice, as if learning that I was alone inside the house was the best thing that could have happened to him. I ran to grab my phone and tried to call the police, but the storm outside meant that there was no signal. I couldn't even get a hold of my parents. I had no idea when they would come back home and I didn't know if this man would be waiting outside for them when they did. It was the most terrifying night of my life. I just sat in a locked bathroom for what seemed like hours. I couldn't get a hold of anyone. I was completely alone and I could hear the man knocking on the front door the whole time. At some point I realized that he wasn't actually knocking and that it was the wind banging against the door. I'm not sure how long I was hiding in the bathroom, but I only came out when I heard my parents opening the front door. I was completely alone before then. You can't even imagine how horrible it is, knowing that you are completely alone and that no one is going to come and help you. That night was the scariest night of my life.